Joining me right now to talk about all of this is Senator Ted Cruz, whose home state of Texas employs nearly 430,000 people in the gas and oil industry alone. Senator, it's good to see you tonight. Thanks very much for being here. Give us your reaction to all of the executive orders on energy today. Well, Maria, great to be with you. Thank you for having me. You know, last week I, I sat outside the Capitol. I listened to Joe Biden give his inauguration speech. I thought it was a good speech. I, I was glad to see him make an appeal towards unity. Uh, I think all of us would like to see greater national unity at this time when we have so much division, so much anger and hatred pulling this country apart. But then he, he, he left giving that speech and he returned to, to, to the Oval Office and literally within minutes began signing these executive orders that were radical and extreme. As you noted, he signed an order canceling the Keystone Pipeline. 11,000 jobs with a stroke of a pen he made go away. 8,000 of those are union jobs. And, and at the same time, he rejoined the Paris Climate Deal, which threatens to destroy thousands of high paying jobs across this country. And, and the answer, I've asked multiple Biden nominees what they would say to the union workers who just lost their jobs because Joe Biden decided they didn't deserve a job. And, and essentially nominee after nominee after nominee has said, well, tough luck. You know, John Kerry in that same news conference you, you, you put up, he said, well, they need to learn to make better choices. What an arrogant, out of touch wow. statement for a centimillionaire to say, you know, you little people, you know, you, I, I don't like the choices you're making, and so your jobs go away. Uh, to, to, as, as John Kerry said right there, quelle surprise that the, the, that, that the Democratic elites have decided that blue-collar workers, that union members, that, 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 that men and women with calluses on their hands, they've made the wrong choices in John Kerry's words. Well, that, that is not a unifying message. It's not doing the job we should be doing fighting for working men and women in this country. I know that when businesses are faced with new expenses, a new regulatory backdrop, which involves higher costs, that cuts into earnings. The first thing they do is look to where to cut the fat. Where yeah. am I going to cut back because I'm facing new fees, I'm facing new regulatory hurdles. Are you expecting business to look at these new regulations around climate and say, well, I'm going to have to cut here, I'm going to have to cut there. And we know that the oil industry is not just one segment. There's a lot of indirect exposure throughout the economy and business that gets touched by this. Well, that's exactly right. And, you, you know, the nobility of the elitist left is, is they show how noble they are when they're willing to give away your job. Notice it's never their jobs they're giving away. It's never their Silicon Valley billionaire supporters. It, it's, it's never Wall Street. It's never Hollywood. It, it's they're willing to give away someone else's job. And, and look, among these orders, one of the things Joe Biden did is he shut down new energy exploration on federal land. Just shut it down again with a stroke of a pen. And by the way, you know who that helps? That helps Russia, that helps Iran, that helps Venezuela. That means America relies more on Middle East oil, sending billions of dollars to nations that are not our friends, and it pollutes the environment worse. The irony of what they're doing is there will be worse pollution. You know, something that, that neither Joe Biden nor John Kerry ever address? Maria, do you know what nation last year had the single greatest total carbon reduction of any nation on the face of the earth? The answer, of the course, United is the States. United States. Yes. Yeah. And what yeah. they're doing is slowing that down. They're saying, let's not rely on lesser producing, more efficient, job creating American energy. Instead, let's go back to being energy dependent on foreign nations. This is hurting a lot of jobs and it's undermining the security of our country. This is also requiring cooperation with China. Look, we talk about China a lot on this program. We have all week. But Kerry says, John Kerry said, cooperation with China is the key to progress on climate change. And that climate is the number one issue between the U.S. and China, as if China has not broken promise after promise across the world. Well, Maria, that's right. And, and, and there is a hopeless naivete among the Biden administration. You know, one of the really disturbing patterns that we've seen come out in this past week with, with Biden nominee after Biden nominee is a warm embrace of China. 
that, that you want to talk about one of the most dramatic shifts the next four years are going to entail is the Biden administration crawling into bed with China. You know, I, I asked multiple uh, Biden nominees, for example, whether they would maintain Huawei on the entities list because Huawei is a global espionage company masquerading as a telecom company. Not a single one of the Biden uh, nominees was willing to commit to keep Huawei on that list. And I'll tell you today in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, w w we had the confirmation hearing for Biden's nominee to be ambassador of the United Nations. She, she disclosed that just a little over a year ago, in October of 2019, she gave a paid speech before a Confucius Institute. Now, Confucius Institutes, as you know, are paid for by the Chinese Communist Party, paid for by the Chinese government. They engage in espionage and propaganda. I authored bipartisan legislation in the Senate that passed into law that has shut down dozens of Confucius Institutes. Well, Biden's nominee to the UN ambassador just over a year ago gave a paid speech there praising China uh, and saying America needs to be more like China. This is dangerous that this administration mm -hmm. as a policy decision is embracing and getting into bed with China. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for President Biden to discuss China's role in the coronavirus. We haven't heard a peep about that. He has not acknowledged uh, China's behavior in terms of allowing this virus to escape its borders and then using the virus as a way to uh, make moves across the world, invade India, uh, go into Hong Kong with new rules, bully everybody in the South China Sea. We haven't heard anything about China's role in the coronavirus from Joe Biden you, yet. You know, you, you look at the nominees Joe Biden is putting forward, they they're ha have a disturbing pattern of being apologists for the Chinese Communist mm. Party. You look at Mayorkas, who was nominated to be the head of the Department of Homeland Security. When he was in DHS before, he personally spearheaded getting visas for big Democratic donors at the behest of Hillary Clinton's brother, including mm. senior executives in Huawei, the Chinese espionage company. The, these are the people they're putting forward are people who as a policy matter, believe that America should, should embrace warmly communist China. Joe Biden, one of the orders he signed, says you can't yeah. refer to the COVID-19 virus as the China virus or the <laughs> Wuhan virus, because God forbid we acknowledge where it came from and which country spent months silencing, oppressing, imprisoning the doctors trying to stop the spread of this virus. and and. The Chinese Communist government bears direct responsibility for the hundreds of thousands of lives that have been lost because of COVID-19. And the Biden administration, it seems virtually none of them are willing to actually say that out loud. Yeah, I want to ask you about other policies. But while we're here last night on this program, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo joined me and he had a word to say about just that. Listen to Mike Pompeo last night here. I've called it the Wuhan virus uh, almost since its inception. It, it began in Wuhan. It's a, it, it is, in fact, a virus that came from that place. We know that the Chinese Communist Party covered that up. We know that they disappeared. Doctors and journalists who wanted to write about it were told they couldn't. I hope and I'm counting on this next administration to do what the American people demand of them and continue to confront the Chinese Communist Party. And as you say, we are no longer allowed to use the term China virus as the uh, stomping on free speech continues uh, drip by drip, Senator. By the way, uh, Google CEO, the former CEO of Google, Eric Schmidt. OK, you, know, you can't get worse than this. He warned today that China is surging to overtake the United States in critical areas. This from the former head of the company that walked away from the Pentagon and the Project Maven. Remember that so that it could go set up its AI uh, office in Beijing. Real quick on that, I want to get to other issues before you go. Well, look, China poses the single greatest geopolitical threat to the United States over the next century. And we need serious, clear-eyed, focused policymakers. Today, when I was questioning mm. Biden's nominee to be U UN ambassador, I, I asked her a, a simple question whether... Uh, whether China had committed a genocide, as the U.S. State Department determined, targeted at the Uyghurs, one million people in concentration camps. She refused even to answer that straightforward question. And, and 
I, I don't know where the decision has been made, if it's Joe Biden directly or simply everyone who surrounds him, but there is now a growing pattern of, of refusing to confront and apologizing for the oppression, the malign activities, and, and, and the anti-American influence of the yeah. Chinese Communist Party. Senator, assess the situation in terms of this incredible sweep of executive orders, the most aggressive we've seen. Uh, today, they, they canceled contracts with prisons. What is that going to mean for the streets and for prisoners on streets? And then there's this, something you predicted a long time ago. There is already a bill to make D.C. the 51st state yep. and the filibuster. Uh, tell us what this means for the American people and what other policies you've seen so far uh, that should worry the American people? Well, sure. A, a big open question is whether the Democrats are going to have the votes to end the filibuster. It will take all 50 Democrats agreeing to break the rules and blow the Senate rules up to end the filibuster. Right now, that the, there are two Democrats who are saying they will oppose that, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema. If they actually hold the line, that will be a big benefit for the country. Now, I got to admit, if, if, if past his prologue, Chuck Schumer has been very good at putting the thumb screws to Democrats, and I actually wonder if they're literal thumb screws at times, because they have had a party discipline that is remarkable. So I hope Joe and Kirsten can hold the line. If they do, the worst legislative excesses that the Democrats want to pass won't pass into law. So if the Democrats don't have the votes to end the filibuster, D.C. won't become a state. Why do Democrats want D.C. to become a state? Because they want two more Democratic senators. Likewise, if, if the Democrats don't have the votes to end the filibuster, they will not succeed with their radical plan to pack the U.S. Supreme Court, to add four new left-wing activist justices to the court, to take it from nine justices to 13, which would profoundly yeah. undermine our fundamental rights of free speech, religious liberty, the Second Amendment. That being said, even if they don't end the filibuster, we're going to see a lot of harmful policies the next two and four years. We're going to see executive actions. We're going to see regulatory actions. We're going to see national security actions. And they're going to take up what's called budget reconciliation, which is a procedural mechanism to get around the filibuster, which means we are headed for a massive tax increase. They can do that with just Democratic votes. I, I, I don't think they're just going to repeal the 2017 tax cut. They are going to raise the taxes on every working American. That's coming. And, and I'll tell you, I'm committed to doing everything I can in the Senate to, to lead the fight to stop policies that hurt jobs and that take away our freedoms. Well, if those taxes are going that high, you could expect a recession on the way as well. Yeah. Clearly, money is mobile, and people will take that money and take it to where it's treated best. I know you've got thoughts on immigration. We're going to Texas next up. Senator, it's great to see you tonight. Thank you, sir.